Hey entrepreneur listeners, this is Perry Brill. Hope your summer's going really, really well. Today is a special day because we are going to be talking about spectacle lenses. And it's not just going to be a bunch of marketing fluff that you might get when your lens reps come into your office and tell you about a new progressive lens design or blue light filter. We're going to be talking to a company that designs lenses for the industry and you probably never heard of them. And if you have, you are way ahead of the curve. They are Indizen Optical Technologies. They are based in Madrid, Spain. And we have the pleasure of speaking with Daniel Crispo, who is a physicist by trade and now is working in the optical industry. And this is quite the pleasure we have to interview Daniel because he just lays down some straight knowledge. We're gonna be talking about business, profitability, very technical lens items, and really the future of lenses and setting the scene for the industry. They are a fascinating company as they are not affiliated with insurance companies. They are strictly lens designers and pair with laboratories to help them in their business endeavors. So enjoy this episode. You will get so much from it. Please share this with a friend because we all need more lens education. It's really a shame that we don't learn about lenses in such a detailed, technical manner. Um, we are so disconnected from the lens side of the business we're in, when we're in the frame side or when we're in an optometry practice. So this is such a great opportunity you have to learn a lot. This is Dr. Brill with this week's podcast. Innocent Optical Technology is sponsoring a giveaway. It's for a book called Modern Ophthalmic Optics 2019 version. It sells for $81 on Amazon, and you could be the winner of this book. Here's the rules. Please go to Entrepreneur Facebook group and join it if you're not already a member. Then make a Facebook video post in 60 seconds or less and describe your go-to pal and why it's your go-to progressive with a for a patient that has a Plano distance and a plus 250 ad. Chances are very good, and you too could be the owner of this most modern ophthalmic optics book. Film yourself on Facebook with the selfie style. All right, I know a lot of you don't like showing yourself on your video, but make an exception if you want to win this book and film yourself selfie style and post it on our entrepreneur Facebook group. We will be term determining the winner on August 6th at 6 p.m. Central Daylight Time. And good luck. We want to see what you have to say. Welcome to Entrepreneur, the podcast for Wizards of Eyes. I'm Dr. Raymond Brill with my co-host, Perry Brill, and we're here to bring you stories about Wizards of Eyes. Yes, what is a wizard, Dr. Brill? Well, these are folks that you may have heard about, may not have heard about. These are people who are actually very successful in doing what they do in all aspects of eye care. We're not talking to self-proclaimed industry geniuses, experts, masters, or gurus, because we're talking to wizards of eyes that make it happen each and every day. They are out there working every day, in the labs, on the road, in the practices, in surgery suites, making lenses, making frames. Yes, we want to hear these back-of-the-house stories about innovation, entrepreneurship, and make you feel excited to do what you do. We want you to be energized about the whole eye care field. And this is not your big optical program. This is done out of the passion of our hearts. Please go ahead and subscribe to Entrepreneur, the podcast for Wizards of Eyes on iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, or your favorite app. Also, visit entrepreneur.com where you'll find our latest blogs and special video content. That's www.eyetreprenur.com.
we want to welcome Daniel Crispo, President and CEO of Indison Optical Technology, commonly known as IoT. Welcome, Daniel. Hi, hi, welcome. Um, happy to be here. Well, Daniel, uh, it's our pleasure to have you here. And I think a lot of uh, Americans don't really know too much about IoT. They may have heard about it, but they don't have a face. So you're going to be the face of IoT here. And we're going to learn more about what you do and, and your journey. So tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became CEO of IoT. Well, um, you know, um, my, grand, my background is as a physicist. No? So I, I studied theoretical physics. And then I did my PhD in, in optics, but maybe it's a different kind of optics, no? It's more about how light propagates, how light interacts with matter, all the equations for, for light behavior. And we worked a lot on, on light propagation through different media and diffractive optics. And, but then there I met some professors um, that were uh, specialized in ophthalmic optics, no? And, uh, right right and bring what we wanted to do is bring all the know-how all the knowledge we had from the university and we wanted to face the challenges of the real world no we didn't we were researchers but we didn't feel happy just being in the university doing papers and all of that we wanted to go out there and see what's there no okay what university did you attend throughout your education this was in Madrid, in Spain, no? This was the University Complutense of Madrid, which is the largest university in Spain. And, and that's where the company started, no? We, we are a Spanish company in, in its origins. And the beginning of the company wa- was funny, no? Because um, my co- uh, I, I, I founded the company together with two other professors, Jose Alonso and Antonio Quiroga. No, and Jose Alonso is maybe one of the biggest experts in ophthalmic optics in Spain. In Spain, there's an interesting fact is that um, all opticians are optometrists. No, there is a four year degree. Oh, okay. There's a four year degree in optometry. And the curriculum is very heavy in physical optics, no? in, in geometric optics, in aberrations, so you have several physicists teaching in the um, optometry school. So there is this link between physics and optics and ophthalmic optics, which I think has been the key factor for IoT, you know, for us to be able to develop the way we have developed. It's on one side, we have all this knowledge of mathematics and um, computer science from our research as physicists. But on the other hand, you know, we are very involved in the school of optometry. So we know things about human vision, the human visual system, about lenses, about how lenses are prescribed, how lenses, about refraction, about how lenses are fitted. So I think being from Spain was important for us because not in so many countries you have this combination of physical optics and optometry, right. you know? Right. And, and the way the company started is uh, Jose came to us and said, uh, this, we started the company in 2005, no? And, and the company started with the idea of independency at its core. Uh, Jose came to us and he said, you know, there is this new technology that is called Freeform. And you don't know anything about the optical industry, but around 30% of the lenses are made by independent laboratories, no? So this, this and right now, what they do is they buy progressives from these big companies that are their competitors. They have no other choice, you know? Right. Mm-hmm. A front-sided progressive is complicated. You need uh, big investments to set up um, a, co- a conventional progressive factory. And an independent laboratory didn't have other choice but to buy these lenses where all the added value is it's in the front surface in the in the old times no before freeform all the added value was in this complex geometry in the front surface and they had no choice but to buy it from their competitors but now with freeform lenses are becoming software in a way no so right. independent laboratories can have the same machines they can have the same software that any other big lens company can have. In theory, they can make exactly the same lenses just as good as any of the big lens companies in the industry. So, so Daniel, I, I would like to summarize. So what you're saying is 
when you guys were starting to form this company, you had a realization that there was a few big lens companies out there in the world that controlled the whole supply chain. And um, you saw a little niche to make the market a little more competitive by offering a kind of an alternative um, solution. No, what, what we thought it, it didn't make sense now that an independent lab would keep buying this added value from their competitors, that they right. needed an independent alternative because really when a lab has the machines, when a lab has the software, the only thing they don't have is that knowledge about optical design, about optics that only a few companies in the world used to have. No, there, there will be a few research centers right. in France, in Japan, in Germany, where they would really know about how do we make a progressive lens? No, what is important in a progressive lens? So we thought that Freeform could sort of open this, no? and we could create a company that would provide this Freeform software and also would provide access to that know-how. No? So for us, from the beginning, it was very important that we were not only going to provide the software, the technology, but we were also going to provide a different relationship where we try to be very transparent, very open about Hey, what is the math behind this? What is the optics behind this? What is the principle that makes a lens better than other? What are we really improving in a, an, an optimized lens or a personalized lens? No. So let me ask you, look, maybe we should backtrack a little bit uh, because we have people that are listening who are not lens experts. Mm -hmm. So could we say there are analog lenses and freeform lenses? Okay. Perhaps you could uh, describe how how it was prior to Freeform and why Freeform is different. And mm -hmm. that way we can at least start off so that we won't lose all the people here in the first couple of minutes. Okay, okay, sorry. Okay. Maybe yes, this audience is different than my... So before Freeform, every, uh, when a lab is turning your lens, a lens into your prescription, the only thing they could do is a very simple surface, no? a, a sphere or a torus, which is... Okay sphere with a cylinder right so all the machinery that the lab would have the only thing they could do were the simple surfaces so if you wanted to make something complicated like a progressive that complex surface cannot be made custom for you you have to buy the lab has to buy that complex surface and the only thing they can put is a simple surface on the back that's going to turn the lens into your prescription so they were orthog orthogonal surfaces. They were 90 degrees apart. They weren't real variable. And they weren't to be made for um, as worn type of design. Yeah, they would be the same surfaces you can put in a single vision lens, no? The, the whole, right. they were made right. only by symmetry of revolution, no? Right. But with freeform, a lab can put any surface they want on the, on the lens. The actual lab that is turning, that is making your prescription can make any surface they want. So they already know everything about you when they are making the surface. Right. So really the most important thing about Freeform is that now I'm going to make a progressive for your prescription. So I'm gonna make the whole progressive surface combined with your prescription in the best possible way because I already know your prescription. I already you're making know that. You're, you're making it all at once. You're, you're making not it like all combining your already made lens or a puck, I think you call them pucks. You're not making a combined lens and like modifying it for your prescription. You're making it from scratch and you're molding that lens? Excuse are me? you molding it? Are you? Are you molding the lens? Is it like come out of a mold or are you somehow surfacing the lens or what, how are you making that? In freeform? Right. In freeform. Well, in freeform, you are cutting the back surface of a lens. So if, if, if we don't know how lenses are made, lenses start, the prescription lenses that go on your glasses start from a big lens that is called a semi-finished lens. Okay. That has to be cut down to the thickness and the size of uh, uh, to wear on your on your eyes. No. So basically you have this big numeric control machines that will be cutting the back of the the back surface of the lens right. until they make it to your prescription and to your thickness no the front surface of the lens is made uh is pre-made right. and is, is made like in in big batches 
This is what we call semi-finished lenses. And then the lab, the, the, the actual lab that's making your prescription lenses, is only cutting the back surface of the lens. And with freeform, what they are doing is they are cutting uh, a surface that can have any shape that you want. No, that's why it's called free form, no? because it's like right. a free shape that you can cut on the back. And this is a true revolution. No? This, I think this has really brought a step in quality to f especially progressive lenses. Right. So, uh, okay. So 2005, you have this idea and then your, how did you go from there once you kind of had this idea? How did you put it into action? Well, we... We got some funding from the Spanish government and also from a lot of friends and family. And we started developing our first freeform calculation software, no? a software that would calculate freeform lens designs. It's going to calculate the surface that you have to put in the back of the lens so you get a good progressive with your prescription. Yeah, we spent the first three years of the company just developing our software. So we started the company in 2005, but we didn't sell our first progressive lens until 2008. So it was a long time just, you know, developing software and, and developing the mathematical models. So those were like the three difficult, painful years where we were just writing software and looking at the results. And um, that was interesting, no? Yeah, that, that's tough. So, um, so can you talk about, IoT calls itself an optical technology company. How is that different than being a traditional lens company? Mm, we, we see, for us, the lens companies are our customers, no? the, the, comp the labs that make the actual prescription lenses. What we do, we see as our mission is to provide the technologies and services that they need to make the best lenses in the world. No? We believe that any lab nowadays, small or large, independent or part of a big corporation, can make the best lenses in the world. It's just a matter of working with the right technologies and the right partners. No? And we try to provide all of that. So we provide lens calculation software on one side, no? our lens design software. But we also provide a lot of service, a lot of support. We help the labs all the time, make sure their processes work correctly. The quality of the lenses is right. We, we're working together constantly, no? And we are also uh, exploring other technologies to offer to our customers, no? Like uh, photochromics that we have started uh, recently to offer. What we would like is that there is an independent alternative for any added value lens. So progressives are one of the big added value lenses. So we provide independent lens designs that can be as good as any in the market for independent labs or, or any, any other companies. And we started offering independent photochromics where, again, our goal is to offer the best possible technology, the best possible performance that can match any other product in the market, but from an independent source. Great, great. So I would like to talk about... Um you know, what makes a, a cheap lens cheap and an expensive lens expensive? What are the properties of the lens? Um, I think, you know, as opticians and, and doctors, we get confused when a lens rep comes in and they hand you a brochure and you're, we're a little unsure. Why is this one lens $350 and, and another lens is $80? They both have the same function, but way different prices. I think there's two components, no? One of them is technology, which I think is a true value added to the lens. And in many cases, it makes the lens more expensive. No, uh, you, a good lens is made with good materials, no? good semi-finished lenses, good blanks, with good software, with good machines, controlling the process very well, with good coatings, good treatments. Doing all those things well makes the lens more expensive. Um, and also you have lenses that are more personalized, which may require additional measurements, may require more sophisticated calculations. That makes the lens more expensive as well. Then there is another big component of price in our industry, which I think is brands or marketing. So in many cases you are paying for a brand 
and then you have to decide you know, if, if all the extra cost of that brand uh, has the value that you want. What I believe is that you can get the best quality both from unbranded, I don't like the word unbranded, but let's say independent lenses versus big known brands for maybe very different prices. And you're probably getting very similar quality or the same quality in, in both cases, no? Yeah, I know, Dr. Brill, you believe that a lens is not born with a name. Go yeah, through that analogy. Well, I have colleagues that say, well, uh, I have to only use, uh, like, I won't say the names, but, you know, a V brand or an E brand. And, uh, and then their optician says, guess what? I, you've been wearing uh, an IoT lens yes. and you don't even know it. And they're, and they're so brainwashed by representatives bringing cookies or candy to the staff. And next thing you know, they've got a $450 lab bill. So, but they don't, they don't believe that it's possible that you can have a, a lens puck that would be very good and it has to have a brand. But I, I think the lenses weren't born with a brand name. I mean, somebody attributed a brand name to it. And then, you know, as far as the marketing goes, then the cost on that. Yeah. So, so it's, fr it's frustrating because I think we assume that the best lens has to be the most expensive lens. And a lot of that is the marketing on it. Yes. Um, on the other hand, you know, I understand why many opticians want to go to their same brands that they trust all the time. You know, prescribing progressives and fitting progressives can be scary for, for many opticians and I think what is important is to provide a lot of uh, good communication uh, about uh, progressives and about the way progressives have to be fit, fitted and help opticians make, make feel more comfortable, more confident when, when, right. when fitting progressives, um, make sure they're going to be well supported when they have a non-adapt issue. Right. Um, you know, the, the, with the history of progressives, you can understand that some of these guys can feel a little scared when changing to different products. But I think nowadays, there's many good products from many different sources. I think what is important is working with labs that give you a lot of support, very good communication, that are very right. honest about the properties of the lenses, you know? See, now it's, it's a little different because even the big name brands say, well you want something a little less expensive, we are a house brand. And uh, so it's different to explain the different levels of quality, just be, and, because the house brand all of a sudden is being promoted. And it's, it's uh, I don't know, $60 instead of 300. And they don't know whether the patient will like that lens or not like the lens. I mean, a lot of people like lenses back from the 80s and did well with those analog lenses. So, so it's very hard to discern what to do now, personally, I would like to have lenses that actually did correct for higher order aberrations. Do you have a, a topography, a, um, aberrometry based system that I can do aberrometry in my office and then you, in, you can include that in a lens design? Uh, right now, we don't include um, higher order aberrations. No, we, we could use measurements from an aberrometer to get maybe an improved prescription. Um, with our lenses, is that, lens, a spheral is that a, like a spheral cylindrical equivalent? Yes. Or not? Okay. Yes, because we, we believe the main aberrations to correct in an ophthalmic lens and a progressive are oblique aberrations. No, so um, errors in sphere, errors in cylinder when you're looking away from the center right. of the lens. So w we believe, given their magnitude, those are the most important um, aberrations to correct. You know that if you want to correct higher order aberrations, the right. main problem you're going to have is that you're only going to be correcting probably in a central area of the lens. And maybe that's good for cases with very high coma or some, some special. Yeah, spherical aberration, coma, trefoil. I mean, mm. there was a technology out, which was somewhat controversial, uh, the Izon lenses. Yeah, I remember, and yes. The TV aberrometer and, and the people that didn't, the doctors that didn't prescribe it say, oh, that's just a hoax. But when you have a patient who's Plano, they're Plano, they're emotropic, and they uh, say, wow, this is the best I've ever seen in my life. And you kind of trick them and say, well, let's try this other one. 
because in the photochromic, it wasn't in a multi-layer. They said, no, it's not the same. So I think they didn't actually know how it worked, but it did work. Uh, and that was our closest to having an aberrometry driven lens. And I'd like to see something like that because we do have a lot of patients who have coma. These are people who have keratoconus, who had LASIK, we had transplants, and we're doing our best spherocylindrical correction, and yet they still do not see, and, and, and we know it's higher order aberrations because we can measure it on our topography mm -hmm. systems. Yeah, for those cases, you could develop a lens that takes into account higher order aberrations. The problem would be that you have to fit them perfectly, you know, right? and also that they, they will give you a narrow field of view. Right. But in that field of view, you, you would get maybe a quality of vision that you couldn't get any other way. No, you know, something we do a lot is we develop um, many um, designs on demand. You know, if we have a, okay. a customer that says, I want a lens that can do this and that, then we, we do that. No, that's part of our, our business. So far, nobody's really asked us for a higher order aberration oh, really? lens. Yes. I well, think we, you know, what happened with this like, lens. We would like that. We would like okay. that. Okay. Hey, maybe we can talk. Okay. Uh, no, we're always very happy to test new things and, and, and work with people that are willing to test new kinds of lenses. Okay. Well, great. Most of all, yeah, we are very centered on R&D, so we are, we are constantly making new lens designs for specific customers, specific users. Yeah, so as far as um, choosing lenses go, um, so when op an optician is working in front of a patient, they, you know, they find the, the perfect frame for them. How, to, how should an optician choose the right lens? Um, you know, let's say we want to optimize it for a larger reading zone. I feel like it's very unclear which lenses provide, you know, the l largest zones because the marketing materials, you know, they, they get this big spot and they say, oh, this is the biggest reading area. And then the patient tries it on and it's a little narrow channel. So how should an optician actually know which lenses to choose for which scenarios? Well, um, I think it depends uh, on the patient characteristics. You know, some patients with low prescriptions, low ad powers, to be honest, most progressives are probably going to work for them. No? Then maybe a selection of the right material with the right coding is going to be even more important than, than the design. No? Yeah, I always, I always say the same thing. If, if you have good customer service, good frame, and a good RX, you're probably going to do well with a lens from 1990 or... 2019 but yeah for 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 many customers that can be true i think uh, i think um freeform has become a true advantage for maybe higher prescriptions maybe base curves that are a little outside of the optimum base curve for your prescription different frames so when you go a little beyond like your plain vanilla low prescription low ad um, user, I would start using a freeform lens that has compensated power. No, because then these lenses, what they are doing is they are reducing oblique aberrations. So what they are doing is they are improving the periphery of the lens in a way that a conventional progressive cannot do. Mm -hmm. And a freeform lens can improve the periphery because when I'm making the lens for you, I already know your prescription, your ad power, the material, the base curve, the thickness, and then I can, it's like I'm making the design from scratch for you in a certain way, no? So um, it, it's a little difficult to put the threshold, no? Which ad power, which prescription, do I start making sure that my customer is getting a customized or a personalized lens? But uh, certainly with wrap frames, I would always go to a personalized lens. There right. you, you will see an advantage. Certainly, you know, higher ad powers above 2.5. I would, I would start doing um, a freeform lens with, with custom power. Um, and then the rest is a little more depending on the optician's experience, no? But there is difference between lenses with more levels of technology and others, uh, but not everybody needs the most sophisticated lens. That's also true, no? Let me ask it from a prescriber standpoint. So let's say you have a frame with a eight base or a higher wrap, and uh, now the patient has a second pair that's more a dress pair. Uh, should they be able to 
uh, perform or see equally well with those, or will they be bothered by one of them has a compensated Rx and the other one really doesn't, because uh, we don't want to cause trouble for our patients. And then we have to say, well, they're made the same, the prescription's the same, but they're not really made the same. So no, how do we they, explain that to the patients that they may actually have to readjust uh, neurologically to the other pair? In that case you are describing, they will have to readjust because having a base curve is one of the main ingredients that affects uh, how the lens performs. So when you're going from an eight base to maybe a flatter base, your magnification is going to change, you know, right. the perceived size of the image is gonna change, maybe the type of static distortion you are gonna perceive is going to change. So you will need some adjustment from going from one to the other, but not because one is compensated and the other one is not, but mostly because you have a very different base curve in one lens and the other. Right. Hmm. So if we describe a, an isoconic lens, you know, by changing, we want to uh, equalize the magnification by changing the front curve and the thickness. Mm -hmm. Do you do those calculations for us or would we have to do the calculation? Um, in, in, in that case, we, we have partnerships with, with some companies that are already offering those solutions. So um, let's say we don't want to do a Shaw lens right away. Uh, but we just want to kind of play around with it and say, okay, you got a plus five in one eye and a plus one right. in the other. You've calculated it's more than a 5% disparity in magnification. Um, do you have I like a, a, a design software that we can plug something in? Yeah, we, do you... we don't do those calculations ourselves. Um, okay. Normally, we the decision about what base curve to use is, is made for us, no, but I see. we work with people like Dr. Show, where, where they'll have their own formulas for trying to compensate those imbalances, okay. and then we'll, we'll, our, our designs will work with that, you know? Yeah, yeah. So I want to jump into some other cool topics. You guys are a very innovative company, and you are in the photochromic market now. So tell us about the exciting efforts you have going on now. Well, um, Photochromic was the next adventure after lens designs, no? We, we saw with uh, progressives that there was a, a big change in the last few years from most, the vast majority of lenses were branded progressives towards where we are now, where we see there's a big market for many companies that are making their own progressives. And we think that the same thing could happen with photochromics right now, no? There is a big, um, the market is totally dominated by one company in photochromics. And we think we what have about to go, huh? What about overseas? Is it still dominated or is there more players? I think everywhere it's, it's totally dominated. There's many players that are starting to try to offer something. So we think it's our mission to offer a solution for photochromic lenses. You know, photochromic lenses are maybe 20% of the lenses we prescribe, but wow. maybe they almost 50% of the value that we prescribe. So we think our customers need a solution that is independent, where the, most of that added value is not going always to the same company, and they can keep more of that added value for themselves. But what we think is we need to provide a solution that is top technology, top quality, that we compete with the market leaders, but without giving up at all on quality. No? So that's always our approach. How do you avoid the patent infringement on uh, different photochromics in the market? Do you have to have totally different technology or do you license yes. some of it? Yes, you have to have diff totally different technologies and work with partners that have their own patent space. So we don't do all the development ourselves. We work with different companies, different research groups, different universities that have intellectual property. I see. Yes, you have to be very careful with a patent landscape. But uh, in the case of photochromics, we, we have a good uh, space for ourselves, no? So, um, you know, what's your photochromic called? A photochromic is called neochromes. Neochromes, okay. And where can people get neochromes? Is it specific to certain lens designs or materials? Well, it's available in many lens materials, but basically you have to get it from laboratories that work with our photochromics, no? because we, 
that's one thing that's very important from IoT is we don't sell anything directly to the opticians or the ECPs. You know, our customers are laboratories and we don't compete with our customers. We don't have our own laboratories. So our mission is to provide technologies to those people that make the prescription lenses. So, but typically if you're working with independent laboratories, they will have our technologies, they will have our products and, and you can get them from them. No? Okay, so um, what's different about Neochromes? Uh, how would you compare it to some other branded products out there? Is the color you know, better? Is it change faster? What are some of the properties? Well, in the case of Neochromes Dynamic, which is our current product in the market, we focused on feedback speed. And we launched a product that was um, two times faster than the market leader in fading back. No, we think fade back speed is one of the main drawbacks of photochromics, no? where you have to go indoors and maybe wait five, seven minutes until the lens is clear. So these lenses fade back twice as fast as the current market leader. And, and the rest of the properties are very similar to, to the uh, market leaders. No, You have one that's a one that will turn dark in the car? Not right now. We are working on a next generation of photochromics where we expect to launch extra, um, some that react with visible light and can, tar, yes. can turn darker. You almost, said, you almost said it, right? Oy, oy, almost. <laughs> um, yeah, with, with photochromics, you know, with photochromics, the challenges are working well in different climates, Right. working well behind the windshield, being always very clear indoors, very dark outdoors. So what we are doing is a lot of effort in R&D. You know, the, the product that is out there right now, Neochrome Dynamic is our first generation, but we are doing a lot of work behind the scenes on working on the next generations of products. Uh, we'd like to be able to offer a complete portfolio with um, the best possible performance. And we are doing a lot of effort that's still not visible, but we hope over the next few years, you'll see a lot of products coming from us that can be used as a true alternative to okay. the dominant products in the market. Perhaps with uh, sports technology uh, in mind or different colors to help with tennis or golf or anything like that? Well, um, we hadn't thought about that, but maybe it's a good okay. idea. Okay, it was my idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, we'll talk about it. <laughs> so what, what new design technologies are you excited about? What's coming in the future as far as progressives go or something else? Well, in terms of design technologies, we recently launched um, Canvas Steady, which is our latest and greatest um, progressive designs. So it uses our Camber technology. And tell, us, uh, tell us about Camber. Camber is uh, a technology we co-developed with uh, Younger Optics, which is our parent company. And um, it is a special front surface that has a curvature that is changing from the top to the bottom of the lens. No, so the lens gets a little more curved as you move towards the bottom of the lens. And what does, this does is that it, it creates less oblique aberration in the near portion of the progressive lens. So when we are combining this camber front surface with a freeform design, we are going to end up with a lens that has less aberrations, especially in the near region. And this is our top product. No? Um, and we've been launching recently our latest generation of this camber steady design. Another lens we have launched very recently, we call In Motion, and it is a, a, a lens that is specially designed for night driving. Okay. So Tell us about that. the progressive version has uh, an, an area that is meant to address um, night myopia. No, so. Uh, a large percentage of wearers tends to have a small induction of myopia uh, under mesoscopic or low, low light conditions. Right. And this lens has an area on the top of the lens that will help you uh, with a little negative power, which will help you in these conditions. No? And it a will little help more you. minus, a little more minus in the top. Just a little in the top. So... It will help most wearers to be able to read the street signs at night. And okay. um, it, it's a design that we, we launched quite recently and it, it's working pretty well. We, we did uh, extensive wearer trials in Spain with 
with drivers and it seemed to really help and be preferred over other progressive tools. So somewhat like a uh, comparable to a near boost on a single, on a single vision, uh, but for distance. Yeah, and, it, and it's the opposite. No, it's not a the boost, opposite. it's like um, Right, a little extra plus, so yeah. a little extra minus. Mm -hmm. So since you were talking about myopia, do you have a, a myopia progression or myopia prevention lens? I know there are some out in Asia, but we do not have them in the United States yet, where it changes how light focuses in the periphery so we can prevent young children from developing more myopia. We, we are currently working with um, some of the leading research institutes in the world, no? like right. the Brian Holden Institute in Australia, right. on maybe what can be done no? with an ophthalmic lens for those cases where myopia is growing very fast in kids. This is something that seems to be very growing and growing nowadays. Yes. Um, we are still exploring no, to see what is really the effect of, of these lenses that have like a different power in the periphery. Right, of the lens. right. Uh, how much do they help or not? It, it's, it's a complicated matter, no? Um, some studies suggest that ophthalmic lenses can help uh, other solutions are contact lenses, other solutions are um, drops. It's not clear yet. Um, we are actively working on it, but we still don't have a product that we could say, look, we recommend that you use this lens, no? Right. Interesting. Yes, it's very interesting. I, we do orthokeratology and just uh, back from Vision by Design, we're all the world leaders in orthokeratology, we call overnight coronary reshaping, trying to figure out how do we get this the technology uh, so that the right focal point is in the peripheral part of the lens and how we create it so we lessen the progression of myopia. So that would be good to be for you guys to be at the forefront of that. We, we, are, uh, we are working very actively on it, but we want to make sure we have something that can be honestly be presented as, as a real contributing to the solution, no? I think there's so much talk, so much noise about myopia management right now that we, we'd like to be careful, no? Right, yeah. no, that's good. So Daniel, we've talked a lot about the technical side, the innovations. I would like to get into more of the business side of lenses. So I know IoT is known for helping companies create private label products. Um, what does private label mean to you in the industry today? Well, what I'd like to say is that nowadays, I would say almost all lenses are private label. You know, when you're getting a lens, even if it's a branded lens, you know, that lens has been made with a specific mm. blank, with a specific software, with a specific machine, with a specific process. Every lab is having to control many elements that contribute to the final quality of the lens. And what is important is working with a lab that is putting a lot of care and, and attention in controlling all those elements, not that they work with good materials, that they control and manage their process, that they use a good software, that they use good coatings. So lenses nowadays are made up of all these components that are being put together by your lab. And your lab can be from a, a big corporation, can be an independent lab, can be from a retail chain, but the real question is, what is your lab, how is your lab making those lenses? No, and, and how is their service? Um, to me, putting the distinction between branded and private label nowadays is, is not where the difference comes from. It comes from labs that care about what they're doing and have put a lot of effort in making the lenses right. And we try to help those labs make good lenses and others that don't. So, yeah, so what, what I hear you saying is you could have two different labs making the same lens, but it could be completely different qualities. Totally. And, and it could be for any kind of lens, you know, branded lenses uh, or private label lenses. Um, you know, finding a good lab that you trust their quality, that they can show you their quality, it's, it's very important, no? And, and a good service. I think that related to that, we have pretty antiquated lensometers, even the automated ones. Uh, it would be nice if we actually saw how they map them. And I know there are a few out there. I don't want to promote 
one brand, but where we could see, okay, look at this maps the corridor. Yes, you have you have unmatched corridors. You don't, have, or you have aberrations in this lens that you don't have in the other. So, because we have all those patients that say, I just can't wear that lens. And we, we check and we think it's normal, but we really need much more sophisticated lensometry in the office. So to see how did that lens actually lay out? Do we have a plot? Um, what do you think about that? Should we have a whole new generation of lensometers that we do a much more accurate job in our office and then verifying those lenses? I think, yes. I mean, if, if money were not an obstacle, you know, you should be able to see actually the power map of your lens, right, right. How, it, how it compares with the actual design that you thought you were getting on that lens. And you could see everything about your, your lens there. No, we, we are a little blind. No, when, when it comes to the practice, to the optical right. practice, you have to trust many things about that lens nowadays, you know, because with a traditional lensometer, you're only going to see the power in a couple of points, no? Right. Uh, are there companies that make those that would be feasible uh, under $10,000 or so for private practices, for small labs? I don't know. The only ones that I know that work really well are much more expensive than that. Okay. I'm, I'm not so familiar with that field. Okay. No? Uh, but we, right now in, 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 in manufacturing, they are used all the time, no? like lens mappers right. to look at the real... Maybe what you can ask from your lab is that they send you a map of the lens, that they send you an explanation of what you are really getting in that lens, you know? So at least you can see what you're getting. Somehow. So they could tell us, a, uh, send us a color map of that specific lens? Yeah, how it compares with the design. Okay. Because, for example, we've done weather trials where, you know, the influence of errors in manufacturing are as important as the difference between one design as another and another. Right. So working with specific lens designs is important, but also working with specific labs where the quality is good is, is very important as well. I think it's more important now than it was before when we had what you call analog lenses. Exactly. Okay, so I want to address prism thinning. So mm -hmm. a lot of people do not understand, especially I would say my colleagues, that they'll replace one lens and all of a sudden the patient sees double. So can you go through just a primer on prism thinning, why it's important, and uh, how you pair the lenses up? Because I, th I had pretty extensive geometrical and ophthalmic optics when I was educated, like a few years ago. But now I think that there's a barrier there, the lab to the optical places. So go. So prism thinning is an amount of vertical prism that we're introducing that has to be exactly the same on both eyes and as perceived on the main direction of sight. Right. Um, and we use this prism to reduce the thickness of the lens, no? because in a progressive lens, the curvature is changing from top to bottom. If you didn't introduce some vertical prism, you would end up with a thicker lens. The advantage with a freeform is that you can introduce the thinning prism that you require based on your frame and based on how your lens is going to fit on your frame. You know that with a conventional thinning prism, maybe you would get always a fixed amount of thinning prism, maybe two thirds of the ad. But with freeform, you can compute thinning prism better. You can make sure it's exactly the same perceived prism on both eyes. Okay. And you can, and you can compute the amount of, the minimum amount of prism that you need. So thickness, is reduced for your frame and your prescription, you know? I don't know if that answered your question. So, so on a free form, do you still need, uh, can you make one lens or will that, or you need to know the amount of prism thinning that was previously done by the lab? You would need to know the amount of prism that was on the other lens, no? You mean if okay. you're just remaking one lens, you would need to know how the other lens was made typically, yes. And is that indicated on the invoice? I know some labs do and some don't. But is that indicated? It should be indicated. The actual prism okay. that you have in the prism reference point should be indicated. Okay. Mm. So that's base down prism placed so you thin the upper, upper part of the lens. Well, you know what? Uh, now with freeform, prism can end up being base down or base up. It's going to depend on okay. where your frame fits and what prescription you have, you know? So... Okay. 
Thin in prism is variable now with, with freeform. It can be oh. more or less. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, moving on to the next topic, you guys just released a book called Modern Ophthalmic Optics. Uh, I know a lot of companies guard their scientific achievements and IoT has always been really open to sharing their research. So um, tell us about that. Well, um, this book was just released by um, my two colleagues, no? the two co-founders of IoT, Jose Alonso and Antonio Quiroga, and another colleague from our research group in the university. And basically, we wanted to put together all of the um, theory that we use for lens calculation. No? Especially, we use this matrix formulation for um, representing power that helps with a lot of the calculations and we think it would be, uh, it's a good formalism to understand modern lenses better, no? And also we try to talk more about progressives, free from progressives. We think the industry may, at a certain level needed a new book right. that speaks about lenses in a modern way, no? Because the right. way we make progressives, the way we make lenses has changed so much. And you were asking me about why are we so open with sharing what we do? You know, what, what we offer is technology to companies that make prescription lenses. So they need to trust us. They need to believe that we offer the best possible technology. For us, it's very important to be very transparent with what we offer. And we also think it's a matter of principle. No, we, we don't like all the obscure principles used in this industry to make up like magic words Too about much buzz buzzwords or whatever. We think that opticians deserve, you know, um, real explanations about what are we doing in a lens, you know? Right. And I've been trying to, maybe it's not easy to explain, but at least I'm not trying to make something up, you know? Right, marketing terms. Here, we've always been very open, like we think that the main problems to improve in a uh, progressive lens are oblique aberrations, and that's what our our lenses are doing and we're explaining how we are personalizing, taking into account position of wear parameters or base curves or wraps. Um, so we think the science is important. We think opticians should know more and more about these things because these things are important to service a wearer you know, and service a customer in, in the optical store. Is, like you were asking, no, when is one lens important versus another? I think an optician has to be able to make those decisions and they need true, honest information, you know? Correct. So that's like in our DNA because otherwise we wouldn't have any customers if, if we didn't show, hey, this is what we're doing. This is how our lenses work. We call Nobody it transparency. Would... Yeah, we call it transparency. Yeah. That's what entrepreneur is all about. Yeah, I do have one more of the technical question, and this is a prescriber's dilemma. So sometimes we need a patient that needs a different level of prism in the upper part and the lower part, but we want to do a progressive. So let's say they need um, two base in distance, but they need six base in near, and you can't get it by decentration. Could you make a variable prism as well as a, a variable powered lens at the same time? I believe the short answer is no, because you know, variable prism is nothing else than power. So a changing right. prism would induce power in the lens. You Perhaps could thickness, a very a variant of thickness. Could you vary the thickness somewhat? Well, I think you power? could play with the corridor, no, like how long, how short, what kind of inset do you have? Maybe um, you you could do different things, or you could try to create like some sort of discontinuity in the, in the surface, you know, to have some jump in prism. But all those things are very hard to make. Um, like a uh, slab, you're talking about like a slab off type. Something like that, that you could do with a free from surface, you know. Um, we are not doing anything like that right now. Um, I don't know what are the limits. Well, we've tried some slab offs, slab ons. They, they, they are very challenging for the free from machinery, you know. I make. see. Well, there's a company out there that has a product, I won't say the name, but it has claims of that somehow that's, it's there to help with, we call asthenopia or eye strain. Yeah. And, um, and I, I'm just not sure of how, how that actually works. I don't know their secret sauce, but 
from the limits of optics, it seems like it's a variable prism uh, of some sort. So, yeah, I don't know. We haven't seen it in detail, no. Like, um, okay. but whenever you hear variable prism, that means power. So you're gonna have to give up something, no. Uh, right. Either you're changing the power or you are varying the prism. Um, you could do things, you know, you could do things with different insets, different corridor lengths. I don't know exactly what they are doing. Okay. Uh, it's not a, just a variation in the, in the thickness then. I, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. But those are interesting questions. Yeah. Like on the, on the limit. I would love it. Like there. <laughs> It'd be great to say, look at you need uh, four in the distance and two up and at near you just, you know, you don't, you really just need uh, no extra prism. You know, so we could play with the prism and really have a much more comfortable RX without saying, you know, you're going to need two different pairs of glasses. And so because mm. that's frustrating just to change, to change glasses for people. So there's plenty of people that have strabismus or other concerns that we, we just have to vary things. So I, I guess you guys can figure that one out too. Yeah, what, what we, we like all these challenges, no? And, and many times we wish, you know, that uh, opticians or optometrists would know us a little better and talk to us okay. because... We live for these things, no? Can we develop, okay. uh, we've developed things like uh, special lenses for children with um, convergence problems. Right. I, I'm not even an optometrist, so some of these things you talk about are a little above my, my head, but we have a very large group of optometrists in Spain, and we're I have a big wear trial facility. Next time you come to Spain, I invite you to visit. Oh, okay, very uh, good, very good. Very interesting for you, because we do wear trials all the time, trying to test different, different aspects, you know, like what is important for our, you know, what do they notice? Why don't they, they don't notice? Uh, we're constantly trying to learn what is important for an actual human visual system, you no? Know, because the theory is very nice, but then the, the human visual system is so complex that it's so hard to, to know right. what is important and what isn't. You know? Lastly, do you have any, uh, of the newer technologies that you're working with, uh, electronic technology, lenses, uh, things that are really designed for uh, visual, uh, virtual reality. For, AI. Uh, uh, yes. How are you doing in the, in the new space of, uh, I'll say, electronic uh, eyewear? Mm, we may collaborate with certain projects for electronic eyewear. Okay. What we try always to bring is the perspective of how does prescription affect all of those devices? You know, what is the best way that those devices can be adjusted to wearers that need a prescription? Because I right. think the, that development is led by technology companies and then prescription is always an afterthought. Yeah, definitely. Right. You have 50% of the population are going to need some sort of correction, you know. Um, but I, I cannot talk too much about those initiatives. Okay. Um, but we, we're working also on some other interesting things, you know, like, uh, one thing we believe is that one of the main problems is how do I choose the best lens for each wearer? No. Right. And we are promoting a solution based on machine learning, no, an artificial okay. is artificial intelligence. Let's try to learn from okay. the community of wearers. No, let's try to get as much feedback as we can from wearers, from non-adapts, from rejections, and start building um, uh, like a, a complex decision system that's gonna tell you, well, for this person that you have in front of you that has these characteristics and that is gonna, uh, that, that wants to have their lenses on this frame or whatever, this would be the best lens for them, you know? Uh, so we, we got a patent on using machine learning for, um, making a, a lens design using data from many possible data sources. So that area of work is one of our main areas of work right now. Okay. Uh, we have a solution right there we call Evo Lens that we are promoting uh, where we do that. No? We use feedback from the community of wearers to keep improving and improving the, the progressive lens design for wearers. No? Any Alvarez lens technology that would be coming to the market? Um, I don't know. I mean, uh, well, you know, no, these yeah. guys at, at least they're always yes. been trying to. We've worked with them extensively. 
Yeah, it's an interesting concept, but uh, I, I don't know. We, it's not part of our main okay. line of work. No. I'm asking you all the yeah. peripheral, the peripheral things here. But you know, for patients who had uh, RK radio keratotomy, they require different prescription uh, morning, noon, and night. And it sure would be nice to have something of good optics that's presentable oh. that you can just dial it in. So it's very frustrating. There are a lot of patients who had LASIK or RK who are very frustrated with their correction. And we should put them in scleral lenses, but it would be nice to have something in an optical correction in glasses. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanna, oh yeah. yeah, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say some other thing we're working on is uh, we're working on um, lens 3D printing, some of our uh, okay. areas of, of research because we believe, you know, there's been some attempts from some companies to launch something in the market. I don't know. I don't know if that's mature yet or if that's one, what's going to work. But we believe in the future, we're going to need different lens manufacturing technologies no? that are more sustainable, that can give you more flexibility and maybe create other types of lenses that can incorporate electronics, like you were saying. Right. No? So, you know... R&D is one of the main drivers for our company. We come from the university. We are researchers. That's what we right. like doing. So we're working on different technologies that we hope can be part of the lenses of the future. No? Yeah. Well, you are what we call a wizard on uh, entrepreneur here. That. You are. No, at least we're very passionate about this and, and about the technology. And, and we're trying our best, no? Well, tell us um, a high level, um, 5, 10, 15 years down the line, where are we going to be in the, the lens world? Um, well, uh, we see in, in the next few years, we'd like to see more of these um, smarter lenses no, that can help you solve this question about how do I put the best possible lens on a wearer? No? Uh, right better personalization, less rejections, more satisfaction from wearers with these uh, sort of machine learning algorithms we are describing. We would like to see also better photochromics, like to see you know, better, better coatings. Um, um, in the long term, um, and I don't know if that's gonna be 10, 15, 20 years, maybe finally, you know, you'll go to a store and, and you'll walk out of there with the uh, with the lenses that you need in in five minutes. No, that that would be great right. for the industry. Yeah, I think we're also going to see a lot of online. I imagine um, on, on one side. No, um, I think online is always going to have certain limitations. I I I like to think of lenses more as medical devices and something right. where you want to go there and make sure it's done right. Um, I don't know. There's all these tendencies going in, in different directions, but I think it's exciting times no? for the optical industry. A lot of Definitely. technology, a lot of changes happening. I think it's a right, it's a good time to be in the optical industry, no? Yes. Yeah, there's so much going on um, and we're definitely in the right space. We're in, it's high tech, a lot of moving pieces, but if you, if you focus, pair with the right vendors, I think we can all be successful together. Like, you well, know, wrapping up, what, what is the best way for practitioners, opticians, all, everybody in the eye care field, the optical field, to really learn more? Uh, other than the marketing, is it, is it your book, or is there, or do you have training programs that say, "Look, at, this is uh, you've learned the 1980s way, but now you have to uh, step up your technology. You need to learn about all the different progressives and." camber versus non-camber mm -hmm. what's the best way we can get up to speed on this that's a very good question no um because we were just saying there's so much technology coming on but still i think the most important factor that determines the satisfaction of a wearer is the optician no and the optometrist is a good prescription and a good fit are so much more important than uh, the good design and all of that no? okay Interesting. Really, it's such a hands-on job now that really the only good you learn to wear is with a good optician <laughs> and spending some years with them. And I think we all need to understand this is a craft, no? And uh, it takes years to master. And, and we like to see it that way, you know? And, and, and opticians taking pride in, in what they do and understanding it's a complex job and they have 
a, a very strong influence on the on the vision of so many people. Um, we have very we have very few training programs in the United States, and most of the training for opticians is on the job training. And nowadays things are so complicated; you can't wait 15 years for somebody to, to learn about it. We have to train them pretty quickly, especially in a, a little more dynamic, specialized office. So we that's something we do need, and I'm not sure if IoT offers stuff like that, or if you have a source. Well, um, we would love we would love to know. I mean, we we've never. Um, one of the things is we've never been really in touch with the community of, of ECPs. You know, we've only been in touch right. with the labs that make lenses, but we would love to get closer and more in touch with the, with the actual practitioners. Uh, one easy way is at all the trade shows. We're normally right. there. You normally will see some of our lens designers and people that make the software and make the designs there. We invite anybody to approach us in Vegas, New York, the shows where we go and ask any questions. Uh, we are also trying to organize more events directly with ECPs. Um, so they can ask us any questions they have, like we are talking here, and, but maybe even with people that know more than I do, right. you know, about progressives yeah. and fitting. With well, we're all siloed. See, that's a part of our discussion today is that yes. we are definitely siloed. Labs don't know what we do. We don't know what the labs do. We don't know what the manufacturers do. But everybody's working with each other's products. But I would challenge you to say, let's uh, have some education of prescribers as well as opticians to say, we need to know not marketing information, not proprietary made up terms but we need to know the truth and transparency so that would cross all the different manufacturers and say okay when we say this it really means this and so we can we can discern it because uh the times where optometrists would say look at there's two types of progressive it was a vip and an xl one's a soft design and one's a hard design i would say a lot of practitioners are still at that level okay and one's a very variable power uh variable add per power um, you know, so we're at a very basic knowledge level as far as prescribers go. And I, I, I think I'm guessing that right, uh, trying to stay abreast of things, but we need more detailed education on lenses. And I know that continuing education classes are a lot of times disease oriented, but very, I'm always impressed that we, although we do a lot of refraction, there's never a class on refraction or how to do a better job with refraction or on lens technologies. So. That would be something that IoT could really bring to the industry and be the leaders in that. So there's another challenge for you. <laughs> well, thank you, and that's that's very good feedback for us. And yeah, that's really a direction that we want to go to into. And we're just thinking collectively. You know, what is the best way to do that? How can we? Because we believe in all the things you said. No, and we believe for IoT that's only going to benefit us. No, because we have to compete against. Our competitors are all like 10 times or 100 times bigger than we are. Right. In terms of branding and marketing, we are not going to compete. We think we can compete with technology and with uh, honesty and transparency and being available. No? So if you have ideas about forums where we can talk or we okay. can... We, we have we'll talk offline. We'll talk offline. Okay. I have, we have, I have ideas. We have ideas. It's going through my head right now. Yes. Um, we're we're going to wrap this up because we're just about an hour, which is um, perfect. Um, so, Daniel, if, Pete, Daniel, if uh, ECPs want to reach out to IoT to learn more, ask technical questions, or um, find the laboratory that's creating those lenses, um, how should they reach you guys? Well, there is an email, which is info at iotamerica.com they can shoot us questions there directly we we so you get an idea maybe all of iot we are at a team of uh, around 100 people worldwide and um, we have uh, maybe around 20 op optometrists that can answer questions and any and people that have been practitioners we can ask questions at different levels uh, you can also reach us through Facebook um, and maybe offline we can give you a little more details about and but we are all about being open and accessible you know the last thing we would like to be is like a secret right. or, or closed secret you know, society because, 
And how about the book? Where can, is it on Amazon or where can... Yeah, the book is on Amazon. It's from Cambridge University Press, I believe. I don't know the exact name of the... Um, it, but the book is maybe for a high level okay. um, op, op, optometrist. It, there's a lot of math in the book. I'm just um, oh, I see. telling you. No? Okay. Yeah, half the audience dropped off. <laughs> yeah. uh, to the listeners out there, we'll have a link to IoT's website and also the book if you'd like to purchase that in the show notes on entrepreneur.com. So, Well, thank you very much, Daniel. It's been most informative. Uh, we are trying to give uh, equal time to practitioners, labs, researchers, ophthalmologists, optometrists, and you certainly did a great job of getting us up to speed on what's going on in the world of lens technology and, and labs. So we had no idea. Well, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity of talking to you. All right. I hope I'll meet you in person maybe in Vegas. There we go. We'll, we'll be, be there. We'll be there. Yep. Definitely. Take care. All right. Thank, thank you so you. much. This brings us to the end of another episode of Entrepreneur, the podcast for Wizards of Eyes. Go ahead and click over to our website, entrepreneur.com, or head over to Facebook to join our special Facebook group, Entrepreneur. See you there.